Westbrook yeah. and bring some back from the garage. I don't know. Oh. Maybe, maybe over time it ages better. All I know is, it's like 1997, I drank. I drank one bottle of that with like four friends when it was fresh. It like just came out. It was like this new extreme beer, and oh my god, it was awful. It took us like. I mean, we were drinking other things at the same time to get through this bottle and playing Jenga. I remember this, like a Tuesday night. So, but barrels have become fun. Um, do you guys do much? Do you guys play with barrels? Us? Yeah, yeah. we have a barrel-aged uh, yeah. beer festival every yeah. year. So, Lovely. barrels have, have become a recent thing. You know, people have been doing it for a while, but it, recently people have really started to kind of figure it out. And they started to figure out that you can do a lot of really cool things. You have to be really careful because it, it, it's a little more fragile. Um, even though you're usually starting with a pretty big beer, like this is our Imperial Stout, it's pretty big to go in before it goes into the barrel, but they're still very fragile. And mistakes can be made. You have to be really cautious with it. Um, but it is definitely, again, just proving the point that there are no rules for American brewing. Um, now, put it in a barrel and add some blueberries. Put it in a rum barrel. Put your lager in a tequila barrel. Put your IPA in a tequila barrel. Those are awesome. Um, you know, you, know, you put, your, put your black lager in a freaking Tabasco barrel if you can get one from Tabasco. You're going to pull all these, they've started learning all the fun flavors that you can pull from the wood um, that can just enhance your beer and make it even more interesting than it was before. Um, and again, I think the whole point is, you know, it, this is American brewery. Um, we want to, you know, American brewers want to do things their own way. They're not going to be told how or why. and. The more they screw with the big beer establishment, the more fun they're gonna have. Every time they take another half a percentage point away, it just gets more and more interesting because that just encourages 10 new guys or 100 new guys to open up their brewery and do their own thing. Are we going to a weird place? Are there too many guys out there that are, are a really decent home brewer that have absolutely no idea what a full-size professional kit is like and trying to brew on it? Absolutely. Will they wash themselves out because their quality is not good enough? Yes, eventually. Do you ever think this, the stupid stuff that certain breweries are doing, like mixing uh, Russian imperial styles with stuff like uh, Sprite, like do you ever think stuff like that's detrimental overall? You say you're changing, you, you make a point of changing the flavors, but yeah, you know, at a certain point, I personally, personally, or for the. The topic of this conversation personally i think it sucks why you know there's there's a limit to what's good and bad but for the topic forward of today again it's you know american beer has and always will be about doing things differently than somebody else making up your own way of doing things um but i don't necessarily do i do i like it do i like it? no it's not always good but sometimes you have to take one step back to take two steps forward, and it's got to, somebody's got to actually put the somebody has to make a Zima, so we can learn that we don't need Zima. And there are a lot of people really excited for Zima to come back. Yeah, exactly. People are stoked. Yeah, Jolly Rancher people can't wait for the sales to just skyrocket. That just You're gonna drink some Zima? No, I don't think I've ever actually had a Zima. Like, no. Zima was your Jolly Rancher. Yeah. What was that? What was I drinking? Matt's so old that when he was 16, <laughs> there was only 18 breweries left. So there was a craft beer explosion. Uh, Little Kings. Little Kings. Uh, yeah, I've I found I found good beer in 1990. Uh, 94. I just started working at Big Red, and it was like the second year they'd ever had the Big Red Beer Fest, which was a lot cooler then than it is now. Now it's just an annoying pain in the butt. Back then, it wasn't a very big deal. Can't wait for that to go on YouTube. Right. Please don't do that. Um, yeah. No editing. Do a little editing there. But you know, back then, it was it was a much smaller event. They didn't have anywhere near as many people coming. It was just something really, I mean, they were really just trying to share the concept of beer. Their stores were expanding and carrying a lot of beers that they'd never heard of. They thought, this is a way that we could actually sell them. All intentions were great. It was perfect. Um, and. You know, I worked. You know, I was working for Big Red, so I worked one night, and then you got a ticket. If you, that was the deal back then. If you worked for Big Red, you worked the event one night, you could go the other night. So the other night that I go, I'm walking around, sampling beers, and uh, you know, I'm trying the regular stuff, and some of it's you know, okay. And then there's, there's one guy sitting there. It's no no supplier. It's just one of the guys. It's the manager of one of the other stores who I've met like twice. And he's just got all this 
random bottles just sitting on the table. What, what are these? What do you, what do you, you bring scotch or something like that? I didn't have these bottles were huge. I didn't know what was going on. He says, no, it's beer. I'm like, okay, well, let me try it. And he handed me a 89 Thomas Hardy Ale. So it was only six years old, so it wasn't that old a beer at the time. But I'm like, I don't understand. I tried it, and I just went, holy crap. And then he handed me a um, uh, Celebrator Dombach. And I was done. I, I never looked back. At that point in time, I, my mind was just blown on what beer could taste like. And I, at that point, I just wanted to try them all. So my friends, you know, we're going out, we're hanging out. My friends were all drinking a light, Coors Light, no light, whatever they were drinking. You know, my refrigerator had Newcastle Brown Ale, Oregon IPA, which nobody else remembers Oregon IPA. Oregon IPA was Sam Adams' first IPA. Brewed, contract brewed under the name Oregon IPA. 12 packs were like 11 bucks. I think right back then it was the first IPA that I'd ever had. So th these are the things that I had. I mean, this is when I'm 23 years old. I'm, I was post first cat beer. Probably that Tom Sorry. <laughs> So. so American styles, is, I think the thing that we keep coming back to are shitload of hops, yep. just over hops, um, spirit barrel usage, and then how high can we get the alcohol? Adjuncts in places they don't really belong. Yeah. Um, you know, like let's put fruit in our IPAs. Um, let's do fruit beers that aren't sour. Uh, it's kind of a uniquely American thing. Yep. Um, what is like the one true American style? So if you flip through, uh, before this class I was actually flipping through uh, tasting beer. American Pale Ale is one he lists. American Barley Wine is one he lists. Um, Those are all like Americanized. Oh, like, in, in, like inherently American? Yeah, inherently. Um, American. Like yeah, steam beer. Steam beer is probably the one that I would come back to as the truly inherently. I don't. I don't, I don't recall ever reading or tasting or hearing about anybody else anywhere ever making a beer in that manner. Adjunct lagers. Yeah. Yeah. Adjunct lagers are definitely American. Nobody else does that. You know, the biggest lager breweries in the world are all in Germany. They would never put rice in their beer. They're not allowed to. I mean, they are now. They still would do. Um, for years they weren't, but they, w they wouldn't do it now. So, but a lot of American styles are going to take an English brown ale and dry hop it. Yeah, well, yeah. That's that's what most of the American brewers. You know, we start with this, and then we add hops, add alcohol. You know, use a ale yeast, which should be a lager. You know, that's what American brewing has become. What can we do to change it just a little bit? Because we have to make you know, we're Americans. We have to make everything bigger. And faster and stronger than it was before. Even if it was just fine, you still have to do it that way. Sometimes it works out great. Sometimes it does not. But that's the whole process. Anything else? Thanks, guys. Uh, next week, mid class for you. Next week will be the, the midpoint. So uh, Evan and I will finish up Belgium from Bob's like master class. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bob talked for two hours about England and Germany. Germany. Bob the Mac. Mac. Uh, you could let me do Germany. Uh, I could do Germany. Germany would have probably made more sense for you. Germany. In your brewery. I could have done. Um, yeah. So I'll finish up Belgium and some other outline areas and we'll kind of just do a review. It'll be very informal class outside of Belgium largely. We'll see. Uh, we'll probably do some more blind tasting. Um, and we'll see where everybody's at. So, cool. Does anybody have any questions about the test or the concept of yeah, it. It's been a long time since I did it. Other guys passed it. But I have passed it. I can